What's up guys, Evil Deer here, your guide, and that sounds really weird in English, but we're just going to go with that. Okay, today I'm going to give you guys a presentation on Esperanto. This is actually the presentation I'm going to give during the language, uh, language festival, and I just need your feedback. I just need you guys to tell me, is it good, is it crap, is it terabad, is it worse than terabad? Is it the most abysmal thing you've ever seen on the face of the planet and you wish to die right now? Just give me your feedback. Um, now, it's going to last about 20 minutes. The actual uh, time frame I have is about 35 minutes, but I'm leaving a little bit of time for questions and also technical difficulties. So yeah, just give me your feedback. Let's begin. Hi guys, my name's Evil Deer, and today I'm going to give you a presentation on Esperanto. Now, for those of you who don't know, Esperanto is a created language. It's a design language. It's about 150 years old. Now, before I jump right into what Esperanto is, I just wanted to say one thing. Don't get it confused with one of those created languages like Dothraki or Klingon or even Navi. Um, it's not like one of those languages that wasn't created for a TV show or anything like that. And also, don't confuse it with languages like Tokipon or Lojaban, which were also created languages but designed with more of a, a, a specific focus in mind. Um, Esperanto is a... Um, although it's a design language, it's an all-compassing language. It's, uh, it's massive, basically, in scale. Now, before I can really go into the language and the culture, I need to give you some of my history so you can understand where this is all coming from. So I grew up in the outback, pretty much where everyone just spoke a really bad version of English. Um, there was no one who spoke any other languages apart from English, except for my grandmother. She actually spoke German and didn't speak English, so that was a bit weird. But I just assumed German was a really bad form of English, and she was just swearing at me and I couldn't understand it. So basically, I grew up with no other languages around me. I had no idea that languages really even existed. I just knew English. That was it. There was nothing else, okay? But that all changed by the time I got to primary school. Now, in primary school, everyone was compelled by, I guess, the, um, the, the system, the government system, to learn Japanese, okay? And this really did not go well. Um, I remember, basically, our classes consisted of us just looking at flashcards of Japanese characters and trying to imagine snakes and worms and people playing tennis in them. Um, and also just going over flashcards about the different sounds and also words. But it was all, I remember at one point I went up to my teacher and I said, how do you say the and a uh in Japanese? Because I want to write like a little short story. And she's like, no, you can't do that in Japanese. And I was like, but what do you mean? She's like, those words don't exist in Japanese. And I was like, but uh, then how do they say the and a? Uh? And she didn't explain the concept that languages are actually quite difficult, uh, different. Anyway, um, by that stage, I'd moved into high school and I continued studying Japanese, although I didn't like it. Now, my reason for studying Japanese was more other, I guess, kind of. Um, it was mainly about the fact that my entire class was female and also that uh, it was rumored at the end of the, I guess, the terms that we would go to Japan and I love the look of Japanese women. Oh my God. No, no, I won't say that. That's terrible. Um, so yeah, I continued studying Japanese. Uh, it was basically the same old stuff, just repetitive flashcards, having no clue what I was learning, um, learning like individual words and no grammar. And basically I could walk away from that and learn, I could say a whole heap of stuff in Japanese, but no actual sentences. Anyway, after high school, I joined the army about four years into the army. I decided it was again time to try and learn a foreign language. And I'd always wanted to learn a language since primary school because I remember watching all those spy movies where the spy would suddenly like swap between languages and I was like, man, he's so cultured. I want to be able to do that. Anyway, um, I decided that it was time to learn a language. I asked everyone around me what language should I learn because I didn't know. And I guess because everyone was a generation older than me, they suggested French. And I tried out French. Um, but the sounds of the language, the grammar of the language, how it like shrunk and expanded and all that type of stuff, it just didn't didn't do it for me, so I kind of gave up. But then one day, while at work, being highly productive, um, I stumbled across a Wikipedia article about international languages. Now, for those of you who don't know, an international language is generally a proposal um, language that's been designed in order to facilitate communication between the different countries that have different languages. Um, and the first language I came across in the international category was interlingua. Um, I remember reading through the article going, this sounds pretty cool. It's like a mixture of, the, uh, of all the European languages. And then I went to like an interlingual website and it was dead. Like there was nothing there. And I was like, eh, yeah, I'm not going to learn this. Um, and then after that was when I stumbled upon Esperanto. Now Esperanto um, was quite different. It caught my attention pretty much straight away. One, at the time when they, like, I think this was back in the 80s or something, they predicted that there was about 2 million speakers. And now this is for a constructed language. And I thought, that's pretty cool. 2 million speakers for a constructed language? Like, that's 
bigger than some other languages because at this stage I'd become a little bit more cultured, I knew these things. But the real thing that got me was the native speakers. Esperanto was no longer just this proposal language, it actually had families that spoke the language. It was um, part of entire family lines. So that really got me. I thought if, a na if native speakers exist, the language must be complete in every single way. Um, and then I read about the, the old purpose of Esperanto, okay? And the purpose was to be a simple, easy to learn, international language for pretty much everyone, okay? Um, so with that in mind, the creator, his name was Zamenhof, um, he proposed the language back in uh, 1887. He basically said, uh, okay, this is the most basic rules, these are the most basic words that we need. Um, the sounds are all simplified. Everything was simplified. Everything just fit into nice little categories. He simplified the language as much as possible. And when I say simplified the language, he simplified languages um, into one language which became Esperanto. So let's just start with the phonology, okay? So first up, the sounds of Esperanto. Every sound matches one letter within Esperanto, okay? Now you're probably thinking, uh, yeah, that's what English does. No, unless you're a linguist, you don't know this. English generally has, I think it's like 22 or 24, I'm not sure, um, vowels, okay, even though we only have five written vowels. So for instance, the a uh in car is different to the a uh in apple, okay? A, 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 a. It's two different A sounds. So technically, that's two totally separate sounds, yet in English we write it with the same sound. And it's not just the A that's like that, it's all the vowels. And then also you've got PH, which is basically an F sound. It's, it's across the board, it's confusing as hell. Um, he also simplified the grammar of language, okay? So basically, before I learned Esperanto, I didn't even know what grammar was. Um, but all nouns in Esperanto end in an O sound, all adjectives end in an A sound, all adverbs end in an S sound. So he put all the words into categories, which simplified it. And actually, when I learned Esperanto, I was forced to learn grammar. And then later on, I was able to apply that to English. And I'm actually really good at English grammar now, just because I had to learn Esperanto grammar, which is so logical. I can superimpose that onto English. So yeah, he basically made everything as clear cut as possible. For instance, the tense in Esperanto. Everything in past tense is, uh, every verb in past tense ends with is. Present tense ends with us. Future tense ends with os. Now let's look at English, okay, um, with the word can. Can past tense is could. Uh, present tense can. Future tense will be able to. What, what's going on there? It's like a co totally different separate word and terms that are just all stuck together just for the future tense. But then past tense is could. It's a completely separate word. But that's also conditional. So it's actually got two meanings depending on the sentence. So it's very messed up. There's no like one rule that applies across all English verbs. When in Esperanto, you learn that one rule in five minutes, you're set. Okay, now the etymology of Esperanto. So what he did, um, it's not really true etymology, but when he picked the words, he basically looked at the most common words in all the biggest European languages at the time, or the most common ones that also he knew. So like Russian, English, French, um, German, Yiddish, uh, Hebrew, Latin, of course. I don't know if I mentioned French, but French again. Um, and a little bit of ancient Greek, tiny bit of Spanish, you know. He picked all the most biggest languages and then he looked for the words that were most common across all the languages like the word for dog in Esperanto is hundo that sounds like hound in english and hund which is dog in german so you see how he picked the most common words now obviously esperanto from the beginning was a political language it was designed as a secondary language for everyone not everyone likes that idea when esperanto was first proposed french was actually the default diplomatic language of international relations and the french um, governments at the time actually opposed Esperanto actively, um, which is quite funny now because the French aren't the, the dominant language group anymore. So basically, it, it got hit with lots and lots of different opponents who were trying to stop its rise as an international language. Esperanto was prosecuted by Hitler. Esperanto was prosecuted by Stalin. It's been prosecuted so many times when you think about it. Now you're probably thinking, well that's all good and all, but everyone speaks English now, we don't really need it anymore. Well, although you're kind of correct, for instance, um, yes, English is kind of the dominant language when you're talking economically. It's obviously not the international language. I remember reading, and I'm going to check these stats later, um, that 12% of the world speaks English natively and maybe up to 30% can speak either fluently or they can say hello. Okay, so there's a big portion of the world which obviously does not speak um, English. 
Okay, so a lot of people think that Esperanto is just a hobby and it's never got beyond that, but it's actually been learned by serious people and being used in a lot of situations. Like, here in Australia, we have Kev Ed Edbley. Now, he was a politician, um, Supreme Court judge. Um, he was basically a very high-level Australian politician who spoke Esperanto. As you can see on the screen here, he was one of the first people to propose a bill to decriminalise uh, decriminalize abortion and homosexuality. Um, and he was an Esperanto speaker, head of the Australian Esperanto Association, head of the World Esperanto Association at one point, um, Law Esperanto Association, <laughs> plus a few other things. He, he was really into Esperanto and he did a lot of big things for um, Australian society overall. Now, a lot of people stop and they go, well, Esperanto sounds really Eurocentric. You said earlier that it takes from all those European languages. What about Chinese and its variants and Hindi and its variants and Japanese and Korean? Well, although Esperanto picks European words, the grammar of Esperanto was heavily influenced by Japanese and then later Chinese in the early stages. So the grammar of Esperanto is actually more closely reflecting that of um, Chinese than it is of, say, English. So although the words, they come from a European base, the grammar is heavily influenced by Eastern languages. Another thing people say is, well, can it talk about everyday topics? Like, or can you only talk about Esperanto? Now, Esperanto can pretty much talk about anything. It's like any language um, that exists in today's world, okay? Any, like, uh, national language, I should say. Obviously, there's going to be points where cutting-edge things aren't standardized in Esperanto, but you can still speak about them. People may just use different words. And that's the same with any small minority language. Um, it... You can pretty much speak about everything in Esperanto. There's no big hole within the language. There's nothing where you're going to go, oh, wow, no one invented that word. It's just that there's certain concepts that haven't been standardized. Now, I'm going to go through how I learned Esperanto. So I told you about that Wikipedia article. Later on, I went to this website called Learnu. Now, Learnu at the time was the biggest free language learning website in the world to learn a language and it actually taught Esperanto. It's probably been eclipsed now by Duolingo, which is just massive. Um, but Learnu was for a time massive, like probably the biggest language learning website in the world. Um, free. Now, I went through some basic lessons there and about after about 30 minutes of my first lesson, I could speak more Esperanto than I could Japanese, which I studied, as I said, for years in both primary and high school. And that was pretty much the point where I was caught by Esperanto. And what I did is I studied for about 30 minutes a day. Um, uh, not that, like, I just did a little bit of a learning lesson here, and then pretty much after that, I just spent the rest of the night gaming and playing World of Warcraft. So I didn't really put too much focus on it. Um, I just put a little bit here and there each day, just 30 minutes, I reckon. Not that much when you think about it. Not compared to if you want to learn another language, um, which I've been trying. Um, so, yeah, I did that for probably about two to three months. And at that point, I decided, you know what, it's time... Um, that I actually meet some Esperanto speakers because I feel I've learned a large portion of this language funnily enough which when you think about it, after three months of learning a language and you're thinking that already that's quite impressive but I went to my first Esperanto meetup now this isn't a photo from my first Esperanto meetup it's just a photo of a local meetup it's literally just over the road from here um, and this is just a bunch of Esperantos that decide to come together one day on a weekend we just chat away you know, share drinks, food, not like share with each other topic. You get the idea. Um, and just speak Esperanto about everyday topics, gaming, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, and I went to my first Esperanto meetup and what I noticed after three months is that I could hold a complete conversation in Esperanto. And I've heard of a lot of people nowadays who are learning through websites like Duolingo able to do that within two weeks and stuff like that. But I, I took about three months and I was able to hold a conversation, speak about things like even politics, which was freaking shocking when you think about it in the language. Now, a year later, after using it, going to these groups every now and then, because I live pretty far away, um, I met the president of the Australian Esperanto Association. And she actually said to me, because at that time I'd left the army and I was training as an actor, why don't you come on board onto the board of directors um, and you can do the media component of the Australian Esperanto Association. Our guy's actually stepping down. And I thought, hey, you know what, I'll give it a try. And that was probably at the point where my Esperanto went and jumped. Like, I got really good at speaking the language because at this point, I actually start, had to start communicating with people outside of Australia. I'd only been speaking with local Esperantos at that time. And it's also at the point where I saw how big Esperanto really was. For instance, the Universal Esperanto Association is based in Europe. Um, it has 
uh, I think probably four or five thousand members. It's quite massive. Um, it's an international organization that actively takes part in uh, UNESCO um, from time to time, the UN, and also other big international meetings. It represents most Esperanto speakers, not all of them. Obviously, 5,000 people isn't the entire Esperanto community, it's only a small portion. But it's the biggest organization and it's got affiliates pretty much in every country of the world. And when I was in the Australian Esperanto Association, I finally saw how big it all was. Now, at this point, I've only been speaking political. Um, Esperanto isn't just political. For instance, a motto. A motto is a large religion in Japan. It's a new age religion, but it's quite large. It was born around the same time as Esperanto was. And funnily enough, the spir second spiritual guider of Esperanto, of um, a motto, not of Esperanto, of a motto, um, actually said that Esperanto is the language of heaven. So now you've got this religion in Japan where people will, nearly everyone in the religion will at least know about Esperanto and learn a bit of it just because of its religious teachings, which is quite fascinating. Then you've got spiritualism in uh, Brazil, which also has a very large Esperanto portion to it. A lot of books are written in Esperanto. It promotes, promotes Esperanto a lot. I'm not 100% sure why. I'll check that later. Um, also, we've got the Baha'i um, faith, which promotes a auxiliary language, okay, a secondary language for everyone. Now, they're tossing up between Esperanto and English, but there's a massive Esperanto um, backing within that religion. Um, in fact, the ex-president of the Australian Esperanto Association is a Baha'i. So, it's not just political, there's people that learn it for spiritual reasons, there's people like me who learn it just due to the ease, there's, there's so many groups within the Esperanto community, it's not just one, um, like, pyramid basically, it's just everywhere. Now, this is a photo, I think, from either um, Thailand or Vietnam or uh, China, I'm not 100% sure. And I just wanted to show you this because this is a photo of um, a small local Esperanto meetup in Asia. Okay, when I went to China, um, I just I realized how important Esperanto was actually in Asia. The Chinese government actively promotes Esperanto; they fund it. Um, you don't get that in Western countries. And the reason they do that is because the Chinese government likes the idea of an easy secondary language. Not the entire government or whatever, but there is a a backing, official backing for Esperanto. Like for instance, Chinese International Radio, which is Chino Radio Internacia in Esperanto, um, broadcasts in Esperanto, um, publishes in Esperanto, does interviews in Esperanto. Does I went there um, to their headquarters in uh, Beijing and they basically got a whole floor of this building dedicated to Esperanto. Um, massive conference rooms and everything. So it's a full-on professional language there. People can um, study it at university and everything. It's quite different to here where people, you, we get no official backing from the Australian government in any sense whatsoever. But in China, it's a career path. So another thing, okay, when I got into the, the language and when I got further into it and I could finally speak and I'd done everything I mentioned, I actually was one of the people who launched Esperanto TV, which was the first international Esperanto TV station. And that basically just broadcasts in Esperanto 24-7. Um, I'm actually a co-producer now. I did found it, but I'm um, stepping back. Um, but Esperanto uh, television is, it's massive, okay. Um, we get 30,000 hits a month from people all over the world who come to watch it. And that gives you an idea of the language. It's the Spora language. It's all over the world. There's no home base for Esperanto. It's just everywhere. There's Esperanto in every country. Um, and now I want to give you a little bit of insight into my travels again. So when I went to Milan and Rome and all that, before I even got to Milan, because I went through Europe on a one month trip, um, I contacted some of the local Esperanists and as soon as I landed, um, they showed me around, they showed me all around Milan. I had a, a personal Esperanto tour guide who actually spoke six languages, um, take me around showing me all the best spots in Milan. Um, all free of charge because uh, just because I'm an Esperanto speaker so you can see how the Esperanto community is it's very tight-knit we always help each other out when we can that's that's kind of like a cultural component to Esperanto which is different to English um, when I went to Switzerland I stayed with uh, me and my wife we stayed with an old Esperanto couple nicest couple in the world we stayed in this house that must be a couple of hundred years old so traditional they gave us the whole top floor of the house they said here's the keys here's the internet password everything up here is yours for the next um, week do whatever you want and that was it we, we came downstairs I would I'd speak to them they prepared dinner for us breakfast for us um, they provided guides and maps of the area where we should go what we should do that gives you again an idea of how tight-knit the community 
um, is. Esperanto is a very international, but it's supportive of one another. Um, when I went to Munich, this was a really interesting point in my trip. I stayed with an Esperanto-speaking family. Esperanto wasn't just a language that they learnt. They didn't learn it like I did. It was actually a language, um, it was, sorry, it was a part of their family for several generations. The uh, mother of the family was actually the great-granddaughter of um, the guy who founded Monato, the biggest Esperanto newspaper or Esperanto magazine. Okay, and it was really interesting because the entire household just spoke Esperanto and I remember I was sitting there and I had like a th maybe a four-year-old kid run up to me um, who wasn't actually even part of the family, it was someone else who was staying with them because like, there was two families in one house and spoke full in Esperanto to me I was like, oh my god, this is crazy. Um, another thing is, uh, w when I left that township, I actually went to this other town that was, um, not township, I went to this other town called... Um, uh, I think it's Hartzberg am Hartz. I cannot pronounce it for the life of me. It's a German name. Um, and I stayed there for just over a day. And this town is known as the Esperanto town. And it was quite interesting because Esperanto has a... It's actually um, supported by the local council and everything there. So there's Esperanto restaurants. There's Esperanto hotels. Um, there's Esperanto signage. Uh, it's really quite interesting to see an entire town um, that has some link to Esperanto. Now, obviously not everyone speaks Esperanto. Now, I'm actually falling a bit behind here, so this here is my personal YouTube channel. I am actually a YouTuber in Esperanto. As you can see, I don't have that many followers, only like 1,100 plus. Um, but I produce videos in Esperanto every day, and it's basically like a virtual meeting area for me and my followers. So as I said, Esperanto is a diaspora language, it's all over the world, we don't have a home base. The internet is our home base, um, although there is um, actual physical meetups around the world, most of us meet online. So that's something I work on. Now, Esperanto cops a lot of crap from people, and one of the things that people who know a little bit about languages but don't like Esperanto say is it's got the accusative case. Now for those of you who don't know, the accusative case is basically this grammatical case which dictates what is the object of a transitive verb. And people go, oh well English doesn't have that, why does Esperanto have it? That actually makes it harder. I just want to get a myth out of the way right now. Although Esperanto is an easy to learn language, it's not the easiest language in the world. It's probably the easiest, most precise language in the world, okay? Um, if you really wanted to find the easiest language in the world, it would be grunts, literally. But it's not very precise now, is it? So that's why Esperanto has some things that English doesn't, but then it has things that, uh, uh, sorry, English has got things that Esperanto doesn't. Now, as I said before, um, a lot of the words came from European languages, and a lot of people then ask, well, what about modern words? This is 150 years old. What about things like computer? Well, Esperanto is like any language. It evolves naturally. Um, words come into the language, um, either they evolve eternally or they're taken from other languages and they just, no one actually controls the evolution of Esperanto. It just evolves on its own, just like any natural language. Um, and one last thing I'll probably speak about is reforms. A lot of people think uh, when they learn like a little bit of Esperanto is I don't like that, let's reform the language. Because it's a created language, we can do that. No, you can't. It's 150 years old, um, as I said. And it's got 2 million plus speakers now. So how are you going to tell 2 million plus people to do a certain thing within a language? It's not going to happen. You can't reform Esperanto just as you can't reform English. The language is naturally evolving. It changes based on the needs of the speaker base. If the speaker base sees a major need for something, it will slowly change in that direction, just like English, just like French or German or any other language. Now, I'm going to finish up my thing here before I take questions. I just want to say one thing. If you have any interest in learning about this language and its culture, um, there's a new course out, Esperanto on Duolingo. It's completely free. Launched about a month or so ago. I'm not 100% sure. But it's now got 105,000 learners. That just shows you how fast this language is also growing. To give you an idea, Ukrainian launched at the same time on this platform and it's only got 80,000 learners. So S1 is actually outpacing a national language in growth rate on this um, uh, online learning tool, which is also interesting because S1 is a lot easier. So you can see that it has a lot more going for it and it's going to grow and it's going to get bigger. Anyway, um, I'm just going to take questions now. So if anyone's got any questions, to throw them at me. And that is where I would finish off my speech and I'd ask the audience for questions. So basically, 
I know I made a few mistakes in there because I'm still practicing this. I'm gonna go over it a few more times um, today, tomorrow, before, and probably Saturday night before I actually give the presentation. But I wanted to give you guys a rough idea of what I'm gonna talk about. Tell me what you like, tell me what you don't. Be honest, attack me, stab me, do whatever you need to do. Anyway, if you've liked this video, give it a like, share it around with your friends, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next video. And if you're not there, I will find you and I will hurt you. <laughs> Okay guys, before I just cut this off, I just want to say that this channel is supported by you guys. Um, I've actually got a Patreon page where you can uh, donate a little bit of money every month to help this channel grow. Now, I've already got three main sponsors so far. Those are Sarah SC, um, Shane Power, and JZ Knuckles. Um, I Sorry, I'm laughing about that one because she just had a big whinge at me about how I was pronouncing it earlier. I was saying Jay-Z, but apparently it's Jay-Z. So anyway, if you want to help me out, just head over to the Patreon page, give me a couple of dollars a month, and that will help me grow this channel. So thanks a lot, guys.